So, okay, welcome to um, the last day of, of SharePoint Evo and to my new uh, session, um, which is going to be very much around the new way of working, so changes in how people sort of uh, see work and, and, and how people do work, how Office 365 fits with that, and how we need to change our approach to delivering projects because of this whole world of work changing. So my name's Ant Clay. For those of you that don't know me, I work for Soul Sailor Consulting. Uh, Soul Sailor Consulting is a, a small micro business, very small actually, it's just me. Um, and we're very much focused on enabling organisational value by positively disrupting people's technology projects. So hopefully kind of changing the way that people are working, moving people away from the status quo and hopefully helping them, you know, rather than just deploy technology, you know, deploy value into the organisation. So that's kind of my focus. Um, I've got a book on governance. I forgot to take this out when I copied and pasted the slides. But if you're interested in SharePoint governance, then it's a nice read um, and fairly. Very good read. Thank you, Nigel. It's a very good read. Um, and there's a discount code if you want to down download that um, on the bottom there. So what we're going to talk about is very briefly. We're going to talk about this, this new way of, of working. You know, the world has changed. The way we do business, the way we work. Is, is kind of ever-changing. We'll then look at how Office 365 supports those changes, and then we'll look at some of the key things that we need to change from our approaches to delivering technology projects to support that and to, to allow us to deliver those values in, in these new platforms and these new ways of working. So what's changed? Anybody tell me what's changed in the, way, in the world of work that means we have to kind of change our approach? The location of where we're working, absolutely. Anything else? No? The technologies, the devices, thank you, Nigel. Yeah, the devices that we're using. Yeah, and work itself, you know, businesses are evolving. You know, we, you know the, we're no longer in a kind of, uh, you know, a, a manufacturing state or engineering. You know, there's a lot more knowledge work out there in, uh, in the world. So the actual types of business and the types of work we're doing is, is changing drastically as well. And technology has evolved, absolutely, but I think we as humans have as well. So you look at the rate of change of technology, and it's huge. You know, let's face it, a couple of hundred years ago, there was no technology. But business has been evolving as well over time, and us as humans, and the way we work and the way we interact is, is also achieving. A kind of, if you think about the amount of work we do, you know, most of us are you know, full-time, five days a week, maybe six, seven days a week sometimes when the, when the project deadlines are there, and we're having to work really, really hard and long hours. And I found this stat that there was over 10.5 million days were lost through depression, stress, and people just not, basically not enjoying their time at work. You know, we spend so much time there, we need to kind of make that experience less painful, more enjoyable, and kind of get technology to support the way people are doing work. I thought that was kind of a, a scary kind of um, a scary statistic, really. Um, and what we need to do is try and get technology to, to help us. And talk, you know, basically, we want to have fun. You know? So I talk a lot in my next session. I'll talk about fun and things like that. But we spend so much time in the office or doing work that you know it has to be at least vaguely pleasurable. <laughs> you know, if we if we're fed up all the time, then we're not going to be productive and we're not going to you know do good work. So my, my view, my perspective is that work itself is, is fundamentally broken you know, at the moment. The way we do work isn't as effective as it could be. The workplace itself isn't great. How many of us you know, put up with really poor offices or workplaces? Even when we work from home, you know, we work from home from the kitchen table with the kids running around us or whatever. Yeah? It's not necessarily conducive to working really eff effectively. You know, the technologies we use, yeah, again, I'm sure we've all, we're all using technologies at work that actually are not fit for purpose or hard work or just don't kind of allow us to be efficient and effective, yeah? Hands up, who, who, who has some bit of technology in their office that they have to use day in, day out, that really, if they could change it or you know, bin it or, or whatever, they would? Not as many. So there seems to be happier people in the workplace than, than I thought. But certainly a majority of you. And to put, there are point solutions springing up 
to try and help us with this. You know, things like working more agile. Um, there's a lot more kind of focus, I think, around the world on workplace design and ergonomics and things like that. Um, things like gamification. All of these things try to kind of help the, uh, help out the way we implement technology and the way we use technology to support this kind of changing world of work but they're only point solutions and they only solve small problems and they kind of shift the focus to somewhere else. So they're not the whole answer. I think we're more productive at home a lot of the time. Yeah, apart from when the kids are screaming around you and things like that. But most of the time, yeah, I think we're more productive at home. How many of us collaborate at Starbucks or some other coffee machine or library or, or what are, yeah? Yeah, most of us are doing work outside of the office, outside of home, in, in quite bizarre, random sort of places. I'm sure there's lots of people in the room and here at the conference that have had business meetings here in the conference centre, you know, at, you know, during a conference. So, you know, we collaborate a lot better like that. And are we ever out of the office? Yeah, how many people have got an out of office message on their email this week? Okay. And does that say you're out of office or does that say... Yeah, we may be a little bit slow getting back to you. If we're in a boring session, we'll reply back. You know, but you know, if it's exciting, we won't. Stop typing emails now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't bother with out of office anymore because the reality is, on my phone, I can respond to an email. I can at least say, look, it's, I need to, you know, be back at the office. So, you know, I'll I'll give you a full answer next week. But here's some information now. You know, you, I don't think you were ever really switching off, which is not a good thing. It, well, it, it is insane, but I, I guess for most of us, it is a balance. We need filters, and as I say, yeah, technology doesn't necessarily support us. So, yeah, absolutely, I would say we do need to switch off. Pardon? Blocking yeah, blocking mode. Yeah, we should do, but, but most of us don't. And to some extent, I think it's a personal choice. I, you know, I'm a small business, so let's face it, if you email me 10 o'clock at night saying I'd like to do business with you, I'm going to respond then. You know, I'm happy to do that. Um, but you know, in different businesses and different organisations and different cultures, I think they work very differently. So I think we should have the ability to either switch off or to filter. Um, but yeah, that's what technology needs to help us with. And we need to be a bit stronger and press that button to say, yes, we are out of office or whatever. Yeah. There was some, Microsoft have, I don't know whether anybody really even knows about this, Microsoft have done a couple of initiatives over the last few years around the new way of work, working. And this has come out of um, the, the Microsoft UK, and they did a thing, it was originally called the Hybrid Organisation, and I did some blogs and, uh, and uh, some tweets around it, and the Hybrid Organisation, they changed the name because you know, everywhere else where we're talking about Office 365 and stuff like that, hybrid organisation means on-premise and off-premise. So they, they kind of changed it to the anywhere organisation. But it was an initiative uh, done by this kind of an advisory board with a lot of white papers and knowledge and information around changing the way people are working to support the new kind of world of work and, and how businesses are working nowadays. And some really interesting stuff. So I think, I have to admit, I've not tested this URL but I, recently, but I think it's still up there. It was only a couple of years ago. There's some really interesting facts and uh, approaches to, to doing business. And then very recently, they, they created a new initiative. I don't think this is a replacement, but it is quite similar to the other one, called Business Reimagined. And the, the phrase at the top there is, if you started your business again, what would you keep the same and what would you reimagine? And I kind of like that, you know. If we, were, if we had a business, if we were in control of a business, you know, and we started again, what would we do differently? What different processes would you put in place? How would you change the culture? What technologies would you put in place if you had that ability to, to stop and start again? So there's, some, again, some great case studies and white papers and videos in there uh, about, in effect, reimagining uh, business. And obviously, because it's a Microsoft thing, it kind of leads you down the path to Office 365 and all the other good stuff. Um, but it is really interesting to, to look at that and see how you know, doing business differently, working differently, changing cultures can be supported by something like Office 365. In some of their research, they talk about kind of, as you typically you know, think, you know, process, technology, people, the usual things. And when they talk about people, um, they're really not talking about just sort of how you support people, but how we motivate people. 
So, you know, we're thinking about, you know, what sort of things, maybe like gamification, you know, how do we motivate people to, to work more effectively? How do we motivate people to, you know, work in a different way? So it's very much around cultures, not just the technology side of things. If anybody's read uh, Dan Pink's uh, book, Drive, it's a great book that talks about how to motivate people and you know, how we, we as individuals kind of can, can work. So that's a, a, a great book. They also talk very much around the workplace. And that's not just kind of the office, but that's sort of how buildings are, are created, you know, having adequate Wi-Fi everywhere, all the things that you need to put in place in order to actually deliver the new world of work and, and, and work in a different, more effective way. There's an anecdote, which I wasn't going to talk about, but I think I will, that um, a, a guy in, 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 that uh, works in central London who works for a big, um, I think it's a mining corporation, big global mining corporation, and he's involved in doing workplace design for them. And it was interesting that you know, we, we look at all these things and we think, yeah, if we create some hot desks, Great, people are going to come into the office and maybe collaborate better. You know, if we put a whiteboard on the wall, fantastic. People will use that and, you know, everybody's going to be more open and, and more effective. And to some extent, you think, well, yeah, it's a bit like technology. If we give them email, they can use email. If we give them link, they're going to use that all the time. And what he found in, in this particular case was they created this fantastic um, open space uh, in the top floor of a skyscraper somewhere in London. And they've got kind of open plan areas, they've got a coffee area, they've got these big kind of weird chairs where you could have a bit of privacy, but you know, it wasn't a meeting room. Big whiteboards everywhere, um, uh, hot desks, all of the stuff you'd kind of expect. And it was all looked great and they launched it and people came and used it and were using the whiteboards and drinking coffee and it was fantastic. And then about uh, two weeks later, he came, kind of came to sort of survey his beauty, beautiful sort of area. And he noticed that some of the whiteboard sort of scrolls were from the first week and hadn't been rubbed out and hadn't changed. And he noticed you know, that there were pot plants on some of the hot desks. And Fred had got a picture of his family there because Fred always uses that hot desk. And actually, it's not really a hot desk now. No one's allowed to use that as Fred's desk. And nobody ever went into the kind of semi-private rooms because you know, people might hear you know, business conversations. So what he found, although it was a fantastically designed workspace area, and they got everybody's requirements and they, they, they delivered what people wanted, people weren't using it. They just went back to you know, permanent desks. I want my little space where I can put my picture of my cat or dog on. You know, I want to work in the way that I used to work. So we need to do a lot more when we're doing changes to support that. And there's a concept, which I think I mentioned yesterday in, in the governance session, uh, called Tumblr. And the Tumblr is um, a, a German word, I think, um, but it basically literally translates to, um, well, I don't know what it literally translates to, actually. But it, what it means is um, it's the guy or, or, or woman who gets up and dances at a Jewish wedding and keeps everybody partying. Yeah, so if anybody was at the conference party yesterday, there was you know, people at the, at the Passion Nightclub that were there dancing to try and get and encourage us to dance. They were vaguely successful in some cases, I think. Yeah, but they, they're there to try and get people to, to in, you know, in the nightclub sense, to, to dance and enjoy themselves, or in a wedding sense, to have fun, to eat the food, to dance, and to enjoy themselves. And in a business context, we need those sort of people to kind of amplify the change that we're trying to put, put forward. So if we're putting in new technology, if we're putting in new working environments, we need people to kind of reinforce that. Otherwise, we we're very naturally just go back to what we were doing before, you know, email, either working from home or in the office and, you know, and not being particularly collaborative. So we do need to think whatever changes we put in, Office 365, changes in culture, whatever we're doing, we need to kind of amplify that and, and, and make sure that it's, it kind of sticks. Technology, obviously, is, 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 is a key area of focus around this new way of, of working. We need to make sure that what we put in place supports what the business is trying to achieve, supports the cultural changes we're trying to do, and supports the way we want to do business in the future. But we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So, why is all this what I've said so far relevant to you guys? Any ideas? I'm making you work, and it's conference day three, and we're all tired, aren't we? So, I, I think there's a few reasons why why this kind of stuff is relevant to us. The first thing is we don't work in factories anymore. You know, the world has definitely moved on. 
most work that we're doing, you know, the most implementations we're doing around SharePoint, Office 365, are to do with knowledge workers, information workers. Yeah, they don't work like we used to when we were in factories. Yeah, so a lot of the ways and approaches around technology projects are focused really from, you know, have their heritage from factory work and engineering and things like that, but we work in a very different environment now. So we need to, you know, consider that and, and understand how that affects us talked about it earlier, but 9 to 5 doesn't exist anymore. You know, what used to happen is, you know, somebody, even in office work, that would come in at 9 o'clock, punch in, you know, or record their time. They'd do what they were told, you know, what their boss told them to do for, you know, a few hours. They'd go to lunch, they'd come back, do what they were told again, and go home. Yeah, now it's a lot more fluid. Now we don't necessarily directly control when people come into work. We're measuring people more on their outputs and what they're trying to achieve as opposed to just doing a set of tasks. So the technology, the culture, all of that stuff needs to support that, which is where kind of things like Office 365 really, really help, can help facilitate that. Organizations are changing. They're moving from command and control, hierarchical, you know, you do what your boss's boss tells you, you know, you don't think for yourself, to a lot more flatter organization where people actually can make decisions on their own. And there's a great quote, I think, um, yeah, there's a great quote from the Clue Train Manifesto. Has anybody read that? Yeah, it's a classic, I think it's about 10 years old now, but it's still a, a, a classic book. Uh, and in, the, uh, in one of the quotes from the Clue Train Manifesto is hyperlinks subvert hierarchies. So if you're in an organization where you can, you know, you can link data, you can have, you know, send hyperlinks and tell people where stuff is, kind of gets rid of the need for this hierarchical, if I want to ask a question, I have to ask my boss or ask his boss, and eventually we get an answer and it comes back down. So again, we need to put technology in to support that. Economic pressures are influencing how we work and you know, how we do business and then how the, what sort of technologies can support that. And obviously we've got you know, cultural shifts. You know, a new generation of people that expect to work in a different way. You know, they want to work in a different way. They're going to start demanding it. These people are going to be you know, our, our future CEOs and directors, and they're going to want to work in a very, very different way. Yeah. A lot of us probably still you know, do kind of you know, get this and work in this way, but you know, as, a, as, a, as a country, I'm not sure we do. Physical constraints. You know, office space is bloody expensive. You know, it costs a lot of money to rent an office in London, or anywhere, really. Yeah, so allowing people to work from home, to work from different places, is going to obviously help us economically. And there's a need to innovate. You know, we're in a very, very challenging marketplace, you know, a competitive global market. So we need to think about you know, what we can do to support that. There's a, a, a great concept from a, a guy called um, Henry Chesbrough who says, open innovation is, a f is fundamentally about operating in a world of abundant knowledge. Yeah, so there is a, we are in a world of abundant knowledge. What he says is, not all the smart people work for you, work for your company. So you better go and find them, connect with them, and build upon what they can do in order to deliver value. And if we think about that, if we need to find people, connect, and build upon it, we need to collaborate. We need those sort of tools and technologies to do that effectively. We need to be thinking more about potentially extranets and building and joining companies together. So where does you know, SharePoint Online specifically, where does that and Office 365 and Link, et cetera, or any other kind of social tool to some extent, where does that fit in with, with all of this? Well, it supports it because obviously it's cloud-based, so we can access it from lots of different devices and pretty much anywhere, anytime. It's always on. When I first wrote this, I put it, it's always on, because yeah, the cloud is always on, surely. And it was about a day later when there was an outage, and it was like a couple of days later there was another outage. It's like, okay, I best not lie. It's not always on, but it's nearly always on. And the reality is, you know, when it goes down, absolutely, that's a pain for your business, but you haven't got to pay a load of you know, infrastructure or network engineers to go and fix the problem. Yes, it's a pain. Yes, it's a problem. But we were probably going to have that problem if things were on-premise anyway, and we just need to kind of shout at whoever is running the infrastructure and get them to fix it quickly. So although that's still painful, it is actually probably costing us less money than it would if we were doing things on premise. So using these kind of 
cloud tools and things like Office 365 allows us to really focus on our business, not on the infrastructure. You know, we don't have to worry too much about the technology side of things. That can manage itself or be managed for us. Yeah, but we can now, as an organization, start focusing on the business and really um, focus our efforts on that. Potentially reduces the bottom line. Matt Groves was talking yesterday about Office 365 and, and things like that, and he was very right in saying that you know, in some cases it's not necessarily going to save you money, but it may well save you hassle. It may allow you to be more agile and work better in the future. Not everything is about sort of reducing, the, uh, re reducing your costs. We've reduced our training needs. Familiar tools, familiar user interfaces. You know, let's face it, all of these things are web pages with buttons and you know, text boxes to fill in. It's not necessarily rocket science to kind of use these tools. And it allows us to look outside of the head office. So especially where you've got organizations that are you know, spread across you know, the country or the globe, rather than just focusing on your little niche, your little sort of office in Birmingham or you know, Scotland or wherever, you, know, you can actually start focusing on you know, how your business is doing work and what your colleagues are doing outside of your little kind of uh, zone of, of comfort in your, in your building. And everything's open, or at least a lot, everything's open uh, or starting to become more open. The way we work, information, all of these things are more open, which means we need to get technology to support that. Oops. So my view when I think about work is that actually we don't necessarily now go to work, we do work, wherever it is. You know, this woman potentially is, uh, is working at home, having a breakfast, filling, doing her emails. How many people respond to emails over breakfast? I know we shouldn't, and my wife kills me if I do that, and she's sat at the table as well, but, you know, we do. Yeah. How many of us want to be able to work wherever we are? Absolutely. You know, whether we're out, you know, maybe not up a big mountain, but, you know, we do want to do that. We want that flexibility. Yeah. Potentially, we want to work with who we want to work with. Yeah, what's actually stopping us from you know, working you know, in the park with our loved ones? Yeah, we may be from two different companies. Yeah, as long as she's not looking over my screen at all the confidential stuff, that's fine. Yeah, but we might want to work together. There's nothing really that should stop us doing that. If that, make, yeah, if that means we're product, pro productive, if that means we can innovate, if that means we can be you know, and deliver our outcomes and our goals, then let's... Yeah, let's work communally. Not quite in a hippie kind of sense, but you know, sort of. We don't work. So what? This is me drinking wine. Sorry, but this is <laughs> this is me. I went to um, I went to America to uh, a conference. As a small business, just because I'm in America, just because the sun's out and it's quite nice, doesn't mean I have to stop working. I can't afford to. As a small business, I, I need to be contactable all the time. So I'm using the hotel's Wi-Fi and I'm getting some work done. I think I was doing a, a tender response at the time. Yeah, you use the time effectively. So we need to think about this and we need to think about the cultural aspects and all of these kind of the way, the way that work is changing. But we need to remember that technology is just an enabler. So if technology is just an enabler, but it's obviously a very key enabler, then how does that affect the way we approach work itself? How does that affect you know, how we deliver projects? Has anybody got any thoughts as to, you know, if the world of work is changing, if we were trying to work in very different ways, how does that affect you guys delivering these technology projects? Any ideas? Absolutely, get hold of new resources, different resources, specialist resources, absolutely. So I've done quite a bit of work where I've been uh, basically included in a project. So, you know, I work for myself and you know, other Microsoft partners get me in to do a specific role, you know, requirements gathering or some governance as part of a wider project team for their client. So absolutely, yeah. Anything else? It's an opportunity, isn't it? Because we're brought in, consultants brought in to sort of change by the way people work. Yeah. So we, as because we are open, we can start helping yeah. other organisations yeah. become open. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, how do we do this then? You know, is it just by having a different kind of project plan? 
you know, what, what do we need to do? And my kind of view really is that there's a couple of things that, that are key to working differently to work in this more, uh, in this more open way. First thing is, and I'll, I'll talk about this more in my next session, so it's one of these things where I've got the slide, I'm not going to repeat myself twice. Um, not B.A. Brackus, B.A. Brackus is still alive and he's making very questionable chocolate adverts. But the kind of role of a business analyst, I think, has to some extent died. So I'm not saying there isn't, uh, you know, business analysts shouldn't do their job and they should all go, because absolutely, business analysts should. But the actual act of analysing business requirements, I think for a lot of what we're doing, has, has, has gone, yeah, because way back in the day, business analysts were very good, still are, at analysing processes and the ways that we're working and making that better, more efficient, less error prone, whatever it happens to be. But now we're working in a lot more collaborative, emergent, open way, analysing what somebody's doing or was doing isn't going to give us the answer. We need to be looking at more emergent things. And I'll go into a lot, lot more detail of, of that after, after lunch. So we need to change our, our approach, and I think we need to work in a more facilitative way in our projects, whether that's gathering requirements and workshops, all of those sort of things. The other thing is, uh, and again, I'll go through this in more detail later, but we need to think about the complexity of work. So this is uh, this guy's Dave Snowden, ex-IBM, big thinker, very large brain. And he came up with this uh, model called the Kinevan Framework. Um, and I won't go through it now, but basically what it, if you look at it, it's a sense-making model, and it basically says that the world of work that we're in, our SharePoint projects, collaboration projects, all of those things, basically fit in this complex zone. Complex being emergent. So we can't just put a solution in and expect it to work. We need to put a solution in, see how that affects and changes, and does that help people get towards their goal, and then build on it. Yeah, so more, it basically kind of runs into this more agile ways of working more flexible ways of working. What he says is uh, the simple zone is uh, the best practice zone, where basically you could put a solution in and it's going to work every time. To some extent, you could think that maybe email is almost best practice. You know, if, if you want email, I give you email, and email is email. I mean, there's differences between you know, Gmail and Outlook and you know, Office 365 and you know, various things. But if I give you email, it's probably going to do the job. But for more open collaboration stuff where we're you know, talking about SharePoint online and most business problems, they're more complex. So we need to work differently to, to cater for that. So I think if we carry on as we are, we'll have the wrong focus. So my kind of view is that what we need to start thinking about is you know, looking at projects in a different way. And I think one of the key areas that I want to focus on today for the next, what we've got, half an hour, I think, is measurement. How do we know in this kind of emerging, evolving world, how do we know that we're making progress, we're actually delivering what we should do? If we think about it, we're going to be delivering projects around a changing culture, more open, yeah, online platforms in an iterative, agile way. So how do we actually kind of measure that kind of progress to our goals. Anybody got any thoughts? Does that mean we don't know how we're going to measure it or we're just not talking to me? <laughs> so I think the problem is that you know, it is difficult. And I think fundamentally, we, historically, we have, we've been fairly poor at measuring progress of, of projects. We, we can say we've done it. You know, the project has been delivered, but actually, have we achieved much value? Are we actually achieving what we set out to is probably questionable in a, in a lot of cases. So we, I think one of the key changes, I think, for us is to think about measurement. Because if we're doing things very iterative and, and, and kind of the, uh, things are emergent, if we don't have a really good idea as to progress we're going to make, we could be going off in any direction. Yeah, and I think you, we've probably seen that. You know, version one of a lot of these cloud products has really been fairly crummy. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily from a performance perspective, but from a features perspective, they evolve. And we look at BPOS versus Office 365, you know, there's a huge difference. Yeah, because it's been iterative, because it's been emergent. You know, Microsoft, in this case, have learned what they need to do. They've understood what pains the users going from going through and emerged, and brought out what is now a very good platform. So technology projects around SharePoint, around SharePoint Online, are fundamentally people projects. Yeah? And what's the challenge with people? Yeah? 
We're unreliable. We lie. Pardon? Unpredictable. We're unpredictable, absolutely. Yeah, we're very hard to kind of manage. We're very hard to measure. So, you know, SharePoint um, Online, all of these projects are quite difficult because we're catering for stuff that's changing all the time. Yeah, we'd like to, yeah, we think we've got fixed views, but as soon as something changes, you know, the, the, it's a bit like the butterfly effect almost. You know, one user has, a, ha, has some kind of crazy idea in your SharePoint project, and the whole project's blown out of the water and going off in a different direction. So we need to kind of manage that. We need to be able to uh, facilitate that and keep a bit of control. People aren't as squishy as Bob. I, I love that character from um, Monsters vs. Aliens. Bob is very, very squishy. Yeah? He, at least people have a little bit of structure. We're unpredictable, but we kind of know which directions we're going to fly off on, you know, hopefully. So it's not all doom and gloom. You know, because we're pe doing people projects and because we're unpredictable and you know, we lie and cheat and have our own personal motivations, it is challenging, but we can do this. We, we, there is enough to, to kind of measure. Einstein said, not everything that, can, that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So we do need to think about when we're measuring our, our, our progress to our goals, our, our, our performance, you know, how, what we're delivering. We need to think about it and measure the right things. So what do you think we should measure? If we were implementing you know, solutions on Office 365 in this ever-changing world, what sort of things do we think we should be measuring? Any ideas? the silence because it is actually quite hard to come up with things or you're just tired <laughs> so I'll help you a little bit so just these kind of things that these are fairly vague but you know the quality of the outputs you know, maybe employee engagement and knowledge retention you know the ability to innovate more improving the workplace you know, reduction in email there's lots and lots of different things that we could we could put most of these are quite hard to measure. I'm not saying any of this is particularly easy. And some of these are more social based, but there are lots of things that we can measure. And the, the trick really for this is to, be, to make sure that we're measuring the right things. So if we're measuring things, if, and I'm assuming that a positive increase is, is a good thing, yeah? If your graph of measurements is going up, is, is, that, is that good? Is that a win? So if, I don't know, if uh, productivity is increasing, is that, is that on its own, is that, is that a good thing? It depends. Go on, Nigel, it depends because? Well, you just met one thing, and then these days you're looking more, you need to look at a whole holistic thing. Absolutely, yeah. So N Nigel said, you know, if we're just measuring one thing, yes, absolutely, that may well be good on its own, but the reality is, all the other indicators that we measure might be going down and be actually really poor. So we can't think about measurement in just a one thing. You know, if we're doing any, if we're doing SharePoint Online, and one of the prime reasons we're doing it is to reduce um, uh, duplication of documents. Yeah, if that's the only thing we measure, you know, it may not be the right thing. They may, they may not be duplicated, but they may be being emailed around, so they may sort of still exist in this kind of semi-duplicated state. Yeah, there's lots of other things. We may be less effective. So yes, there's no documents that are duplicated, but actually everything takes twice as long to do. Yeah, so that's not a good thing for the business. So we need to stop and we need to think about what things we're, we're measuring. I take a lot of my, a lot of the things I do, I take from outside of the, uh, well, certainly outside of the SharePoint technology world. This great book by uh, Eric Rees called The Lean Startup which is very much around startup businesses. But I say in, in a lot of my sessions, I see you know, startup businesses and, and, and business models are very similar to a project. Yeah? There's a lot of very similar characteristics. And Eric Rees talks about the, this cycle of uh, how, how uh, sort of uh, startups could be developed. And I think we can take a lot from that. One of the things he talks about is, in effect what Nigel was saying, is this thing of vanity metrics. Just because the system's faster, does that, just, does that mean that the whole solution is good? Is that you know, helping the business? Not necessarily. If we've reduced duplication of content, is that good? Yes, it is good, but it may have other repercussions elsewhere. <coughs> so we very much need to look at vanity metrics and make sure we don't have them. 
What's what? Anybody tell me what a, a, a really obvious vanity metric is in a SharePoint world? If we're talking, say, an intranet. Yeah. So how many how many users are using the system? How many people? Uh, this, I see this lots. You, know, you say, well, how good? How how's you know you've inter implemented SharePoint online? You know, that you've got it on an intranet. How's it going? And they say it's fantastic. We've had you know a thousand people have hit the home page. <laughs> Woo! Excellent. And then you say, okay, and what and and what value have they done from that? And so I don't know, but a thousand people hit the home page first day. And you think, well, that's great, but you know, are they getting any value? So that a lot of the metrics, absolutely, it's useful to know that a thousand people hit that. You know, homepage, but we need to know whether they had any value. Did they, when they got there, did they find what they wanted? What did they do next? So we need to think a lot more around not just measuring single things, but looking, as Nigel said, at the whole, at, at the system. You know, what value is it actually delivering to the users? I think that looks slightly blurred, but the typical way that we do things is we build something, we measure the effect, how many hits to the homepage, and we learn from that. 1,000 hits, actually we're a 2,000 company. Where are these other people? Why haven't they gone to, to the site? Uh, and what Eric Reese says is that's kind of the traditional way, and that's kind of how we, in effect, that's how we implement stuff. But he looks at it in a different way. What he says, and I don't know whether you can read that, but it, that says assumption. So he says that we should understand what we are trying to learn, uh, what we're trying to learn. So if we want people to go to the home page and um, have an overview of, of their schedule for the day and what they're doing and latest knowledge that's come into the, into the system. That's the kind of assumption. We're assuming if we implement this technology, people will get value from the home page. That's what we wanted to learn. That's the positive outcome. In order to get to that assumption, in order for that to be true, what would we have to test? What things would we have to put in place to be able to say, actually, these 1,000 users have been to the home page and they've got value? So we work out, in effect, what that metric is. And then we think about what experiment, and these are his terms, probably wouldn't use those terms <laughs> to your business, but what experiment do we actually need to build to get those metrics? And it's kind of part, part of this is, um, I think it's minimal viable product, MVP, he calls it. Um, so that's what Nigel is, MVP. <laughs> um, so... Doing this cycle means actually we're not introducing any waste. We're only, we're only trying to focus on what we're trying to deliver, the difference we're trying to make to the organization. We're making sure we can measure it, and then we're, we're, we're basically doing that. So it's a different way of approaching things, but I find it quite useful to think, you know, if we're doing a home page, we want to make sure we're getting value from it. You know, whatever element, whatever piece of functionality we have in the solution, we need to make sure that we can track that it's delivering value. Otherwise, it's waste, or we don't know what impact it's having. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. The other thing is really this kind of, the last part of that is the thing called validated learning, which is basically looking at the feedback you've got from that kind of experiment loop and going, is that taking us towards our goal. So when you get those measurements, is that taking us towards our goal? So everything's emerging, in my opinion. You know, SharePoint, SharePoint Online, all of this stuff isn't a one-hit uh, one project. You don't do the project, yay, we've delivered uh, you know, an intranet online, let's leave it. Yeah, it's emerging. We're going to be doing lots and lots and lots of projects. You guys are going to be busy forever doing this sort of stuff, Yeah, which is good. But when we do these measurements, we need to make sure that we're measuring and we can see what progress we're making towards our goal. And if we're not making progress, or we're not making progress quick enough, or you know, the results say that actually this isn't working, then we need to step back and change what we're doing. You know, it's no good. A lot of organizations, I'll see they'll measure stuff and they'll go, you know what, user adoption isn't very good. But hey-ho, we'll carry on. You know, and they don't address that. Yeah? We need to look at the stats. You know, if we're taking stats, if we're making the effort to learn from what we're doing, then we need to actually do something about it. So what can we do to kind of measure this complexity? What things have we got or could we potentially have in our toolbox to help measure this and understand what value we're getting from, from things like Office 365? Any, any suggestions, any tools that you guys use? Yeah, so all the new search tools. So search, yeah, search, the search. All the measurements, yeah. The, 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 the analytics. Stuff, yeah. Yes. 
So search analytics, potentially a vanity on their own, but absolutely, I think in conjunction with other things, very much so. No, but, 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 but the analytics uh, within search, you've got all sorts of different things. Number of pages hit, uh, time takes, slow, 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 slowest loading page, um, you know, which page has been most popular, less popular. So there's a whole suite of things there which you can use to measure. Absolutely. And, but I think we have to be careful that we don't just rely on those because it's a lot of what we're doing is value driven. A lot of the solutions that we're delivering is value driven. And they, they may say that we spent an half an hour on a page or you know, whatever, or that a page is very, very popular. But did people enjoy the experience? Did people get value from it? I don't know. So I think you need that plus, in my opinion. But, but how, how do you measure enjoyment during the experience? We shall come on to that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Absolutely. No, you're, I, and I think that's a very good point. It's not an, a, an engineering measure. So, sorry, for, the, for those that didn't hear, although I think m most of you did, um, you know, it was about looking at more subjective uh, measures, look at more, yeah, basically what people would call the fluffy stuff. Yeah, absolutely. The fluffy stuff's great. It gives context, and as you rightly say, if you do it right in a controlled way, can add a lot of value to the analytical stuff. So my view is, I don't know when it's the next slide, absolutely, we need to use quantitative and qualitative measures. Beautifully segued into it, thank you. Yeah, we need to use a combination of things. Just doing you know, analytics will give us a sense of things, absolutely, but we need, <laughs> basically we need the fluffy stuff as well. So what, in my opinion, what are some of the things we need? Absolutely, getting feedback from end users. Yeah, what do the end users think about the solution? What's that? Are they getting value from it or not? Yeah? Basically getting IT and the SharePoint team to start talking to that business. I talked yesterday in the governance session about having a SharePoint center of excellence and having that kind of structure where you've got very much business-facing SharePoint people that understand the technology but are also can have a sensible business conversation with the end users and business stakeholders is, is valuable because you get that kind of pulse. You understand what people are feeling. If you just leave it to help desk calls and things like that as to gauging whether people are like the solution or not, I, I think we miss a trick. Technology metrics, as Nigel rightly said, that is valuable. We need to use those. You know, search metrics, site traffic. Um, the other aspect is, is bad behaviors. So if we've got a SharePoint online site and we're hoping that we are, we're gonna collaborate better, if email use is going up, we might have a problem here, yeah? Because if email usage potentially could be seasonal, again, these things need lots of thinking about, but looking at other things around, looking at the system, and I mean the system as a, you as a business, as an organization, is important, not just SharePoint Online. You know, potentially, you know, recruitment. How, how many people have you got coming into the organization or leaving the, the organization may be an indicator as to how valuable your technology solutions are. So we need to think what, a lot wider. I love this one. So I, uh, using goal alignment, I think, is a fantastic way of, of trying to understand how you're doing. Um, so goal alignment is really just saying, you know, we're just saying, you're basically, are all our requirements aligned to our vision? So obviously you need to get a vision. I can help you with that if you can't get it yourself. Um, and really what it, what it says is, you know, if you take each requirement, if you take each bit of functionality, is that helping? Is it making a positive difference to your vision? If it's not, either get rid of it or fix it. Yeah, and if you look at your vision, yeah, the requirements are kind of how you get to there. So using that is quite a good way of just thinking through the solution we've got here. Is it actually helping us get to where we're going? This is one that I think yeah really does get missed out. Yeah, because we're in this technology kind of world, and yeah, things can be done on a report and be very very exact. Gut feel. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's not, you, you would never sort of base the next phase of your project just on gut feel. 
but I think it does play a huge part. You know, what's your gut feel about how the users are using it? You know, what's the gut feel of you know, the value people are getting it? Use the system yourself. You know, does it feel like it's delivering what it should? So I think gut feel shouldn't be ignored. And if you get a problem, I, uh, again, I, I, I think um, this guy who was very much in, uh, involved in the Toyota production system and the birth of Agile and things like that, there's a technique he, he came up with called the five whys. And it's not literally five whys, relatively speaking, but a lot of the case, if you ask why five times, you know, why aren't people getting value from the system? Because they can't find what they're getting. Why can't they find what they're getting? Because search is rubbish. Why is search rubbish? Ah, because the users aren't tagging the information, but they could, but they're not. So by asking why five times, and it could be three, it could be 10, you quite often get to the root cause of what the problem is. And it's quite often not technology, it's quite often people and how we're using it. Yeah, technology probably does support it, but probably not in a clear enough way. Yeah, so that's quite a useful technique that I've found for just digging into you know, some of these anomalies. If, you think, if you're a bit confused, the stats are saying one thing, but the business is saying something else, then this is quite a cool technique to, to use on that. Stories. Who uses storytelling in their business? Excellent, fantastic. Ooh, we can have a talk about that later then. That sounds good. Yeah? yeah user, stories. user stories. So user stories, absolutely, from an agile perspective. Who uses the kind of more fluffy you know, story, storytelling? Yeah? About fables. Fables. <laughs> <laughs> stories and fables and short stories and long, yeah. <laughs> Fairy tales. Absolutely. So listening to the stories, listening to what people are saying in the business, you know, what are they saying is fantastic. Actually asking your business to, in effect, describe the value of a solution in their own words can be a real great insight as to how well your solution's going. You know, if you ask them to say, you know, so how are you finding it? They won't tell you, well, feature X and Y doesn't work. They're more likely to say, well, on Tuesday when I uploaded this document, it was really painful. I had to do all this metadata. And then Fred said, you get a story. And I think stories can be a really powerful way of understanding, engaging both problems, but also opportunities, how you can improve. And then the last thing, and I'm actually going to sort of go through some of these things uh, in the next session, is what I call collaborative play. It could be, yeah, people call it game storming. People call it innovation games. They're basically really names of books with a load of techniques in it. But there's a lot of kind of um, collaborative, not always hands-on, but hands-on sort of tools and techniques that you can use to basically gauge what people think, what value they're getting, the, the positives and negatives of solutions. I did a session in, in Belgium um, about a month ago at a conference that was about continuous improvement of technology platforms. And we, made it, we, we basically went through it as a, a, a couple of hour session and we basically assumed that we were trying to improve email and went through 10 techniques that basically went through a whole way of looking at email, looking at everything that was wrong with it, then looking at what we would do to improve it and then prioritizing those and then coming up with a plan to deliver those changes. So using these techniques is great. You get you know, 20 people in a room, you can generate a huge amount of value and understand how you need to take the platform forward, how it's performing. It's resource intensive. You know, it's not like sending a survey, but the reality is sending a survey asking people what they think is fairly poor. You, you don't get great results. So it is a really powerful way using kind of visual and getting people actually engaged in, 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 t in techniques to tell you how to improve the solution is extremely powerful. So I want to kind of finish, amazingly, I'm almost on time, which is, uh, which is good, um, with just some, some highlights of what, what I think we need to do to, to manage this kind of new world of work. Yeah, we need to measure our progress towards a vision. I think that's very important. We're not just putting a technology in and hoping it's going to achieve results. Yeah, we need to be trying to achieve something, achieve something that's making a difference to the organization. We need to stop focusing on the technology so much. Absolutely, we've got to implement it, but that shouldn't be what drives our projects. We need to change the project focus from the technology, from very analytical things, to more value. How can we get value from things? We, we absolutely need to deal with complexity. 
You know, whatever it is, whether it's people, processes, technology, complexity, it really is a fundamental part of delivering new solutions now. And finally, we need to embrace new ways of working. The world is changing. The solutions we're putting in are now, you know, first of all, they were becoming more collaborative. Now we're becoming more social. You know, there's always going to be something new. We're all going to, always going to be trying to work in a slightly different way. So that's evolving. So we need to embrace that and try and think about how we can uh, cater for that within our projects. So thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>